Well, good evening, everyone. All the graduates of our programs for many years, people that might be interested in taking our new programs, and many others here tonight, and many more will be joining us over the evening. It's just so really just exciting to be here after all these years of running uh, the Taurus Psychology Victor Frankl Organization. And tonight is our first annual conference of for life coaching. And it's from people around the world, people that have been in our programs, people are interested in our programs. And it's a really just a very, very special evening tonight honoring uh, Dr. Victor Frankl, the work we can all be doing together, as well as our three honorees that I'll be talking about with you uh, shortly in the evening. So I guess we're gonna get started right now and into the program tonight. Um, let me, first of all, if you're new to our Torah Psychology family, let us let me introduce everybody and start with myself. Um, I'd like to welcome you. Tonight we'll be looking at the history of TorahPsychology.org, answering the question, who was Viktor Frankl and why is he still important? We'll be interviewing a very special student of mine and she has a great story to tell. And we're gonna be having an award ceremony tonight, um, honoring three of our uh, graduates who have gone on and created their own programs and are successful coaches. So a lot is really happening tonight. Let me talk a bit about what Hakel is. This is a Hakel event. It happens every seven years. It says in the Torah that in this appointed time in Sukkot, in the year of Shemitah, when all Israel comes to appear before God in the place he will choose, you shall read this Torah before Israel and their ears, assemble the people, the men, the women, the children, and so on. And not only is that this entire year, it's even for the end of the year, before the new year starts, we're promoting Jewish unity with this very special gathering that's happening tonight. So with this hockey in mind, let's let's all get started. A bit about me, if you don't know me. Um, I'm an author of a number of books. New one that's coming out, I'll be talking about it later on tonight. I'm a therapist. Um, I created the TaurusPsychology.org organization first by starting a conferences in 2016-17. We ran a whole bunch of conferences on the work of Viktor Frankl and spirituality in, uh, for therapists and for coaches. I'm an adjunct professor, coach, and owner of a new organization, which no one knows about yet, called mytalkplace.com. If people want therapy, this is a new organization accepting insurance where people could get therapy online in the Jewish community. My training is in CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, something called EMDR, eye movement desensitization reprocessing and trauma-focused CBT. Um, I work with attachment theory, attachment therapy, somatic experiencing, logotherapy. Um, I'm also the creator of something called TartarPsychology.org, which you all are part of right now. And I've created a new book talking about my psychology called Inspirational Therapy, which is coming out shortly. Many of the clients I deal with over the years, before I was even a coach running this organization, were people with depression, anxiety, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, various addictions. And one of my biggest specialties is as a marriage and family therapist is marriage and relationships that people are struggling with, whether it's marital relationships, uh, shaduchim, people having trouble getting married. These are all the things I've been dealing with in my practice for years. In 2016, um, we started Taurus Psychology to promote the teachings of Viktor Frankl. In that year alone, we ran two conferences. We brought over 400 therapists together um, and we talked about the importance of spirituality and therapy, where it comes from, who Viktor Frankl was, why his writings are so important. And we published, or I published the book, Think It Will Be Good in 2017 on the topic of Viktor Frankl and spirituality and psychology. And then we began the coaching program soon after for the public, which for many of our students have been in over the last six or so years. We've actually had a thousand people graduate from my coaching programs. Our graduates live in North America. They live in England, Europe, Australia, and Israel. Um, our students are a collection of teachers, rabbis, rebbitzins, Huston and Kala teachers, speech therapists, lawyers, doctors, and everyone in between has taken our courses. And I'm sure many of you have some of those backgrounds here even tonight. We have five upcoming training programs in the near future, starting November 7th after the Amtobim, our transformational life coaching program. Now, many of you were my students years ago don't, don't even know about some of these programs. 
but we have the transformational life coaching program, our core program. We have the mind, body, and soul program for trauma, which is based upon Peter Levine's work of somatic experiencing starting December 6th. These are all 15 week courses, different evenings or days of the week. Our marriage and intimacy program starting January 8th. A new program called Healing the Inner Child is starting February 4th. And a addiction recovery program, which I'm actually in the middle, second part of it right now, is starting again in May after the Jewish holidays of Passover, Pesach. And tonight we're going to be honoring three of our graduates. And this is a new tradition. Each year we'll be honoring three graduates that have succeeded in coaching. We'll be honoring people who have succeeded in the field of parenting, in the field of education, and the field of addiction tonight. So the guys, the question is, why do we need coaches? Well, I don't have to tell you that if you're taking my courses or you're interested in this field, but let's review some of the important things. One is um, a lot of addiction today. There's alcoholism, internet addiction, violence. Ultimately, what a lot of this comes down to is a tremendous sense of meaninglessness in this world today. And people want help. People want to find meaning in their lives. People are also seeking change in their lives. Some people want to uh, do better in their marriages. Some people want to get married, become better parents. Many people want to make more money. People want to feel more secure. People are just looking really to grow in life. And for all these reasons and above, there's no time like now to become a coach and to help people around you. I can tell you, knowing, knowing most of my students for many years, most of you are people that have good hum human skills, relationship skills, you're, you're good listeners. But before you took my courses, you didn't know how to professionalize your, your listening to people and how to really help people. In all my courses, you learn how to professionalize your relationship with a client, talk to your clients, meet the individuals that need help, do a good solid intake to find out what their issues are, um, find out what their strengths and weaknesses are, identify their goals, and really help them to change and, mod and, and motivate them towards change. That's all happening in our courses. When you take our courses, you learn how to do those skills. And three of our awardees tonight will be talking about what they learned from this program and how it's helped them help many other people in their lives. I can't tell you since we started COVID, since we started, excuse me, Torah psychology about seven years ago, what's happened in the world. Um, I believe that at a certain point when COVID started, my life as a therapist was over. No one ever comes to my office that you're meeting with me in today in my office. Um, I would never have clients again. My coaching programs would be closed. But actually, the exact opposite happened. Since COVID-19, there's been an explosion, a literal explosion in the, in the rates of depression, anxiety, and addiction. Those who have children or teenagers know any child today right now under, let's say, 14, 15, 16, that went through COVID, their lives have been changed forever. The, the feelings of isolation, uh, feelings of depression, feelings of anxiety, uh, phone addiction, internet addiction, everything that was already wrong structurally in our society kind of just exploded during COVID and it's still going on. So guys, there's an awful lot of work to do and we're gonna learn how to do it together. A lot of my work in this field began when I was writing, well, before I wrote my book, but while I wrote my book as well, I was influenced by a very great psychologist named is Margaret Orenberger used to read her articles. And this is what she said about therapy and the limitations of therapy. And listen carefully. The more experience I've acquired in short-term models of treatment, the more skeptical I've become about offering permanent solutions to life's complex issues. Many people have anxiety and depression, often suffer from it all their lives, even after a good response to therapy. And that most people also need, and I quote her, a daily program of meditation and spiritual connection. And here's where I come in, and that, this is what I add. What, they, what she really means is they need to find more meaning in their lives. There has never been a greater need in human history for people to discover meaning. And this is exactly what, she, exactly what she's saying. If we can help people come up with a daily program of meditation and spiritual connection and meaningful activities, we'll really start helping people. And that's exactly what Torah psychology is all about, helping people find more meaning and finding that spiritual connection, which they really long for. This was not me that said this. This was other great people like Carl Jung who said this. Carl Jung was actually the one of the ideologues 
when the AA movement, Alcoholics Anonymous movement started about a hundred years ago, a little less than hundred years ago, uh, they turned to Carl Jung, who said as follows about addiction. And this was almost prophetic along with Viktor Frankl for what we're dealing with now. He said, spiritus contra spiritum. It turns out in Latin, the same word for spirituality or the soul is the same word for alcohol. Spiritus is spirituality of the soul. Spiritum is what you're seeing on the right side, that jug of beer. And he says as follows, a spiritual experience is needed to counter the addiction to the spirits of alcoholism. And I quote from him, this is on the, the equivalent on a low level of the spiritual thirst of our being for wholeness expressed in medieval language with the union of God. What people with addiction are seeking out, and this can only be done by people who have the right eye, the right spiritual filter to see this, is what's underneath all the addictive properties of our society, all the addictive symptoms and behaviors, people that are suffering, and I include both depression and anxiety, while desperately seeking meaning in this world, but they just can't seem to find it. The answer will not come in modern psychotherapy. Psychotherapy can play a role in this. We have to wed psychotherapy with spirituality to find the real answer to people's problems today. It's about spiritus, not just about psychotherapy. And this is what Carl Jung talked about on addiction and meaning. Let's watch our first video tonight. Very short video. Some of you may remember this from earlier classes of a very famous psychiatrist talking about how Carl Jung understood uh, how addiction is cured or greatly helped through spirituality. Here's our first video. Let's make sure things are working here. Yep, and here we go. Salt Jung at his house in Kusnacht varied widely from American heiresses and the German writer Hermann Hesse to the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous. Dr. Jeffrey Satinover. Basically, the motive for starting Alcoholics Anonymous came out of a patient of Jung's experience. And Jung's communicating to that patient the idea that essentially he was not going to ever successfully get over his alcoholism if he did not find God. The official history of Alcoholics Anonymous traces the group's origins to Jung's diagnosis of the incurable alcoholic known only as Roland H. His craving for alcohol was the equivalent on a low level of the spiritual thirst of our being for wholeness expressed in medieval language the union with God. What people seek in addictive experience is something which in and of itself is normal. That, that is to say, the craving is normal. The craving for certain kinds of elation, for a certain sense of specialness, for heroism, for cessation of pain, and underlying all of those really, ultimately and, and most powerful, is the uh, seeking of a sense of meaningfulness. Don't you And that, my friends, is exactly right. What people are seeking ultimately is a meaningful life, towards a meaningful life, as Simon Jacobson would say. That's what they're all looking for today. Unfortunately, therapists and some coaches are not really trained and understand how to, have, how to help people have meaningful experiences in life. And that's exactly what we're here to do in this program, Towards Psychology. We are here to learn how to help our clients find more meaning of their lives through the works of Viktor Frankl who created the bridge. As you all know, Viktor Frankl was the author of one of the most famous books of the 20th century called Man's Search for Meaning. He wrote that after the camps. He was in four different concentration camps, including Auschwitz. And um, we're going to be talking a lot about Viktor Frankl tonight. I also wrote a book about Viktor Frankl called Think It Will Be Good um, in 2017 about my understanding of Frankl and how to use is thinking to cure illnesses like depression, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress disorder and addiction. Let's look a little bit about uh, Viktor Frankl. He was born in 1905 and he was raised and spent most of his life in Vienna. He was a psychiatrist who at some point in his career before the Holocaust was specializing in helping suicidal women in Vienna. From 1940 to 42, he was the director of the neurological department of the Rothschild Hospital. And here's the big gap we'll talk about in a minute. But after the war, from 1946 to 70, he was a director of the Vienna Polyclinic of Neurology as well. So what happened in four, between 42 and 45? 
In 42, Franco was deported to a Nazi concentration camp along with his wife, parents, and many other family members. He spent time in four camps in total, including Auschwitz from 1942 to 1945, and was the only member of his family that survived. In 1945, he returned to Vienna and published Man's Search for Meaning, which is now in 24 languages, and according to the Library of Congress, is one of the top 10 books of the 20th century. In his book, Man's Search for Meaning, if you've had a chance to read it, if not, you really should. Uh, the first half is about his experiences in Auschwitz, and the second half is about his therapy called logotherapy, or the therapy of meaning, which by the way, according to Frankl, it was a misnomer that he created a psychology in the camps. In, in fact, his psychology was formed as a young adult and even as a high school student, many years before the Holocaust. The Holocaust did not have him search for meaning. He said what he believed to be true, he would now prove in Auschwitz, but he already has theories fully established before the Second World War. All in all, he wrote over 30 books. Now, many of his books, uh, we don't have in English, so we don't know about them. We only have some of his books uh, translated into English. He lectured in over 200 universities in five continents. He was a recipient of over 29 honorary doctorates from universities around the world. And there he is in his 60s and 70s mountain climbing, which is one of his favorite sports in Vienna way after the war. What was so fascinating about Viktor Frankl was his battle with Sigmund Freud, who was known to be the father of modern psychotherapy and psychoanalysis. He wasn't a guy you lightly rubbed up against Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud was the most famous psychologist, psychiatrist in the world. He was actually a neurologist, I believe. And his understandings of the human mind and human relationships really transformed most of, you know, all of human history at that point in the uh, early 1900s. And uh, he became the father of psychoanalysis and he had some pretty radical theories that shocked the world, but took the world's interest. He talked about the unconscious mind and how 90% or maybe 99% of our thinking happens on an unconscious level. But he also talked about these dark and deep, deep secrets we hold within us, what he called this drive for pleasure led by something called the id, modified by the id, by the ego and the superego. And um, a lot of discussion about sexuality, which not everybody agreed with. And one of the main people disagreed with him was Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl was known as a genius in, in his younger years, in his 20s in medical school. He was allowed into Freud's society, but he openly disagreed with Freud, which is something no one would ever do publicly. And he did not believe man's drive was for sexuality and for pleasure. It was for meaning. Man, when he does not have meaning, will dissolve down to the level of pleasure. And then Frankl went to the, the second great psychoanalyst in Vienna. His name was Alfred Adler. And he was also kicked out of Alfred Adler's society because Alfred Adler believed that man's essential drive was for that of power. It's called social psychology. And again, Viktor Frankl said it was man's search for meaning, which was his essence. So again, when you don't have meaning, you go towards alcohol. If you don't have meaning, you go towards debased sexuality. If you don't have meaning, um, you descend to all these different levels. But it's really that drive for meaning is what people ultimately need. So whereas Freud emphasized the struggle between these competing drives and desires on both an unconscious and conscious level, Frankl emphasized the soul's potential to transcend the limitations of the self. Remember, it, it's not about the self. According to Freud, it's about the self. According to Frankl, it's about going beyond the self for a search for deeper meaning and, I might add, acts of loving kindness. And you'll notice the slide that I've been giving out for years to most of you in my classes. Um, we have in psychotherapy a real debate. Do we focus on a person's past or do we focus on a person's future? Or some people say the present. Where is our point of focus? So there are those about 100 or so years ago, 130 years ago, so we need to focus on our past, most likely. Our drives, our cognitions, that's how we think about the world, our experiences, and our traumas. That's where a lot of psychotherapy really falls into. And anybody here that's been for psychotherapy or studied psychotherapy knows that most therapists are trained to go back to your childhood, to go back to your pain, to go back to your conflicts. But Frankl took a radical view. He says that the past is not we're going to heal. We're going to heal in the future. We're going to heal when we focus more on our, our values, on our goals, on our spirituality, and what we find meaningful. 
So it's not about the self, it's going to level of nose, which means meaning, going beyond the self. And this was the conflict. According to Freud, uh, we focused on the past. According to Aaron Beck in Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, we focus a little more on the present, but our past thoughts and how we arrived at our thoughts. EMDR, for example, something I'm certified, I help a lot of people with trauma, we go right back into the traumatic experiences. If they're abused as a child, if they suffered in school, we go right back to all the trauma to resolve how they're feeling about themselves in the present. But Viktor Frankl really disagrees. He says, no, we have to go beyond the self. Paradoxically, the more we focus on the self, the more problems we have. A man is only complete when he finds something beyond himself. So Frankl is the world of the future. And he created something called logotherapy or the therapy of meaning to help our clients focus on fulfilling meaning. And that's exactly what coaching does. Classic coaching does not go back to past conflicts. We have to know about a person's history. The question is, where do we focus as psychotherapists? How do we really help people? It's really in the present. It's mostly in the future. What will I accomplish? What has not been accomplished yet? And when we go beyond ourselves, we find real healing takes place. And that's what exactly what Victor Frank was writing in an unknown book, which I'm discussing in my new book that I'll be talking about in the next few slides. Um, after the war, he wrote another book, and it was called The Unconscious God. What a remarkable book at that time of psychotherapy. He said at our deepest unconscious level, there's a part of us that takes us beyond ourselves. And in this book, he talks about this spark of God within us, which desires to fulfill itself in the world. And unlike the Freudian unconscious or the id, which was dark and negative and sexual and destructive, he talked about the deepest secrets of man as his godly spark looking to transform the world. And when that spark of the human being is frustrated, he goes down to the world of sexuality, goes down to the world of power. But ultimately, it's not about that. Ultimately, it's about finding more meaning, is uncovering, uncovering one's spirituality, uncovering that spark within all of us. Therefore, he wrote the book, The Unconscious God. I'm now going to reveal to you a tremendous new video, which I never saw before until recently. It was Viktor Frankl speaking at a conference in the early 70s in the West Coast United States about his book, The Unconscious God, and why people find it so unusual and why it's so controversial in those days to talk about God, the unconscious God. I mean, if you talk to Freud about the unconscious God, he would laugh you out of his office because according to Freud, God was an invention of man to protect himself. According to Frankl, God's reality, a human dimension, which we have to embrace um, and discover really what's in that spark for godliness, that spark for spirituality. So let's watch just a few minutes video on, I've never actually I've never seen it before until recently, uh, Victor Frankl speaking about um, his book and his work with a group of other psychologists. And here he is, here he is, Victor Frankl, rarely seen before interview. First of all, to honor you, and then to make public the announcement of the Frankel Library and Memorabilia at the Graduate Theological Union. We are particularly interested today in your published writings, and I note that your latest book in English has an intriguing title, The Unconscious God. And it occurs to me that this is an unusual title for a psychiatrist to give to one of his books. I wonder if you'd comment a bit on that book. It's uh, a deplorable state of affairs that such a title should be unusual or challenging a psychiatrist because it uh, depicts the actual situation and this is that for too long a time psychiatry has closed its, eye, its eyes toward a phenomenon such as religion. Uh, because religion is also a human phenomenon. And any human phenomenon should have been taken into account and taken at face value by psychiatry. Instead, for too long a time, as I said before, psychiatry, more specifically psychoanalysis, 
even more specifically Freudian psychoanalysis, has tried to convince us that religion is no more than just a collective uh, compulsive obsessive neurosis of mankind, that God is no more than just the projection of a father image, and so forth. And what I think is that psychiatry, or for that matter, psychology, should remain open without uh, uh, selecting certain phenomena that it allows to be existent. It should be open to all human phenomena. And one of the most important phenomena in human life is man's reaching out for a meaning to his existence and even more his reaching out for an ultimate meaning to existence and this believing in the existence of ultimate meaning is uh, the root or the crown of religion of ultimate meaning is uh, the root or the crown of religion. And this, in this sense, in this widest possible sense, religion is also an entirely human phenomenon and has to be taken at its face value rather than being to, uh, dismissed as a symptom of neurosis of a, uh, uh, a one aspect of the Oedipal uh, situation and so forth. What a remarkable video, and you can just understand why he got in such trouble with Sigmund Freud. We also understand why Victor Frankl was not studied in the schools of psychology for the last 70 years. I'm sure there's other therapists here, but as a graduate student, two universities, we never heard about God ever in therapy, nor do we hear about spirituality, and for sure we never heard about Viktor Frankl in therapy. There was one textbook I had many years ago, one textbook, at the back of the textbook, there was half a page that noted the existence of Viktor Frankl. So his work was really hidden for so many years, it's only his writings which allow him to get through the last 70 years, the popularity of Holocaust studies and Man's Search for Meaning, my goal is to bring him to life and to teach people how to utilize exactly what Viktor Frankl was talking about. One of the terms he talks about in a lot of his books, which is the problem he says in modern psychotherapy, is something called hyperreflection. Hyperreflection is Frankl's term for neurosis that causes people to place more focus on themselves than on their goals, thus making it less likely for them to achieve those exact goals. Dereflection, what does that mean? That's what he wants us to do, is drawing the client's attention away from their symptoms as hyperreflection can lead to a state of lethargy and ultimately to more inaction. And that's why Viktor Frankl wants us to coach people to go beyond the self. It's all about overestimating the self, going greatly beyond the self, which, you, which ultimately allows you to become oneself. A very famous video in 1970 or 71, in the University of Toronto speaking to students, Viktor Frankl then says the exact same thing with a beautiful analogy. It's a little fuzzy to see the video. I'll summarize it in his image that he's gonna talk about at the end of the next video. Here it is. They wish to make a lot of money. They wish to make a lot of money. In Europe, every American student, if more every American adult, is regarded as someone who is just out to make a lot of money. Really, 16%, 16% of these students regarded their main goal and concern in life to make a lot of money. I'm quoting literally, make a lot of money. And you know what the top class, the top category, we say category, category, what do you say? category was among, you excuse me, but uh, I know I am speaking a marvelous accent without the slightest English. Now,
You know, you know what the top category was? 78% of these American youngsters were concerned as they expressed it themselves with finding a meaning and purpose in their lives. So this is realistic, a realistic view on man. And you know, you won't believe it, gray, uh, gray hair, my age, I started taking flying lessons recently. Do you know what my flying instructor told me? If you are starting here, wish to get here, say east, heading for this, and you have a crosswind, you will drift and you will land here. So you have to do what we pilots call a crabbing, he told me, C-R-A-B, crabbing. You have to head for north of this uh, uh, air, air field, and you have to fly that way, you see, as if you headed in this direction. If you are heading here above this airfield, then you will actually land here. But if you head for here, you are landing here. This holds also for man, I would say. If we, if we take man as he really is, we make him worse. But if we overestimate him, It's premature, your applause, you will soon know why. If we, <laughs> if we seem to be idealists and are overestimating, overrating man, and looking at him that high, here above, you know what happens? We promote him to what he really can be. So we have to be idealists in a way, because then we we'll wind up as the true, the real realists. And you know who has said this? If we take man as he is, we make him worse. But if we take man as he should be, we make him capable of becoming what he can be. This was not my flight instructor. This was not me. This was Goethe. He said this verbally. And now you will understand why I, in one of my writings, once said, this is the most apt maxim and motto for any psychotherapeutic activity. So if you don't recognize a young man's will to meaning, man's search for meaning, you make him worse, you make him dull, you make him frustrated, you still add and contribute to his frustration. While if you presuppose in this man, if in this so-called criminal or juvenile delinquent or drug abuse and so forth, there must be a a, what we call spark, yeah? a spark of search for meaning. Let's recognize this, let's presuppose it, and then you will elicit it from him, and you will make him become what he in principle is capable of becoming. Roger, so well said. We have to as coaches, as therapists, as helpers, as healers, overestimate the potential of our clients. Overestimate. I mean, from a spiritual perspective, it's just a proper estimation. From a psychological perspective, it's going beyond the self and helping people to become what they truly can aspire to become in their lives. So that's the essence of coaching, isn't it? And therefore, logotherapy has certain principles we have to understand that help us as coaches work with people. One, according to Viktor Frankl, life has meaning under all circumstances, even the most miserable ones. If you remember from my classes when we dealt with suffering and struggle of suffering, we were able to learn techniques, according to Frankl, that we could even help a person get down to why they suffered or what they can learn from their suffering. It's a remarkable process. Frankl dares go there with our clients and we can learn how to do it from Frankel to heal a lot of people in a lot of pain. And the second point he says is our motive, main motivation for living is our will to find meaning in life. And that's when that is repressed, so to speak, we'll not be very happy individuals. We'll be doing what a lot of people are doing today is descending to the world of 
let's say, Netflix, addiction, mindlessness, meaninglessness, and so on, and then having all the symptoms of depression, anxiety, and all the types of ills we're seeing specifically during and after the COVID crisis that we're facing. And what are the ways to find meaning? He describes in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, three levels. One, we need to help our clients discover their creative values. Creative in this sense does not mean creativity, it means what we do, what we create with our lives. So that means helping a teacher teach, a doctor heal, a psychologist heal, psych heal emotions, a, um, a car mechanic repair an, an engine, a surgeon heal the body through surgery, a dentist heal somebody's mouth. We help our clients find their meaning in actually what they do. And if they're frustrated in what we do and what they do, we help them find other things to do. I've spent a lot of time in my career with my clients helping depressed people find better jobs, retrain in certain areas. But I understand it's an important value to have something you enjoy doing in life or something more meaningful. If you're stuck in a meaningless position, it's very hard to be happy. So according to Frankl, we need to help our clients develop what he calls their creative values. Number two is 2A and 2B. He calls it experiential values. One is loving someone, and B or two is experiencing something. So loving someone means teaching people um, about what is love, what is the real essence of love, what does it mean to really give to someone um, without even expecting certain things in return. He's not saying you should be, God forbid, in an abusive codependent relationship. We're not talking about that. With reasonable, healthy people, we need to experience love for the sake of loving. Hopefully both people can do that with one another. And two is experiencing something. He wants people to go into the world and enjoy the world, to see the wonders of the universe that we live in, the stars, the moon, nature, culture, the world. There's so many remarkable things in this world. There's a lot of unfortunate pessimism today in today's politics. Everything's falling apart, but there's so much beauty, such joy in the world, such potential, such wonder. Nothing less than what the Rambam says in, in, in uh, Mishnah Torah. He says we need to go out into the world. We look up in the, into the heavens. We look at the immense, uh, uh, endless universe, uh, an infinite universe. And we see ourselves as this little tiny speck of dust. And we're just in a state of tremendous awe of the universe. And that's what he's talking about, that, that idea of experiencing something greater than ourselves. And we take our opportunity with our clients to help them enjoy life, um, go, for, go for a hike if they're feeling depressed, um, learn an, a new instrument, which is a bit hard to do perhaps, but gives a lot of meaning when you experience something of that beauty and that nature and music, uh, to create some painting, some artwork, to do some uh, uh, something valuable like volunteering and helping people that need you. That's where you start healing when you experience things beyond yourself rather than focusing on yourself. And third, Viktor Frankl explains, and this is what he's most famous for, is when we're faced with in an inescapable situation and we cannot change the situation, the last of all human freedoms is to change ourselves or to change our attitude towards our situation. We can help our clients uh, find meaning when they're suffering. And that meaning will be found in how they choose their attitudes towards their suffering. What could it mean? And we'll be coming up in a few moments talking about somebody who's been through a hard time and how she changed her attitudinal values to change her life. And this is what he refers to in inescapable situations on the top right. And I quote Viktor Frankl, everything can be taken from a man, but one thing, which is the last of human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. And so therefore, Frankl says we have freedom to find meaning in what we do and what we experience, or at least in the stance we take when faced with a situation of unchanging suffering. And therefore, Frankl claims that ultimately therapy has its role, but therapy is only one part of the situation. Therapy needs to be completed by logotherapy and by coaching. And this perhaps is one of the reasons that logotherapy never developed as a full school of psychotherapy in the way that other schools did. Because Frankl's work in logotherapy can work in conjunction with other therapies. Cognitive behavioral therapy, for example, I'm not against it. I practice a lot of it with my clients. But once I help a person undo their negative thinking patterns, their negative self-beliefs, that's only one half of the problem. Now we have to have them fulfill who they ultimately are to fulfill certain values. 
So logotherapy as a system is not limited to just logotherapy. Whatever system we're working in, we add on meaning, we add on logotherapy, but there, thereby doing so, we complete individual, we complete psychotherapy through logotherapy and ultimately through coaching a person to achieve more in their lives. Let's listen to Viktor Frankl talk about how he understands a person can be helped to find meaning even in the most difficult of human circumstances. Here's an interview, I believe, in South African television in the early 1980s. Frankl, what is the difference? Dr. Frankel, what is the difference between people who are able to pick themselves up, get over life's problems, and those who are not? The decisive factor is decision. The freedom to, of choice, the freedom to come up with a decision. It should be, I would like to become this way or another in spite of conditions that should only seem to fully determine my behavior. I wish to act freely as a responsible being, which is a human being. I wish to act in accord with heredity and environment using owing what I become to them, but also if need be in spite of the worst conditions. That, this is exactly what you could watch and witness under severe extreme conditions of strength, uh, of, of st stress or of uh, or tragic conditions. Just think of uh, people uh, living for several years under the worst conditions of prisoner of war camp. There is a whole body of, of, uh, of psychiatric literature about that, or for that matter, in concentration camps. And this is what should be acknowledged. People are free, and if you watch or study the lives of such people in just a detached, down-to-earth, empirical, strictly empirical, scientific way and fashion, other, in another way than you presented it and you commented it in another way, then people get the picture, the impression of a human being as something, not someone, something that is fully determined, whereas they don't recognize and acknowledge the freedom and the responsibility, the responsibility for themselves, the responsibility for making something or someone out of himself. So your basic philosophy is that life has meaning under all conditions, but how easy is it when there's a sense of hopelessness, a sense of despair, to recognize this meaning? Let me present you, confront you with a somewhat uh, strange definition of despair. As I'm used to uh, proclaiming is that despair uh, can be explained in terms of a mathematical equation. D, capital D, equals S minus M. What does it mean? Despair is suffering without meaning. As long as an individual cannot find, cannot see any meaning in his or her despair, he or she will certainly be prone to, in its suffering, I wanted to say, no meaning in the suffering. He or she will, uh, her will certainly be prone to despair and, under certain conditions, to suicide. But at the moment they can see a meaning in their suffering, they can mold it into an achievement, into a, they can mold their predicament into an accomplishment on the human level. They can turn their tragedies into a personal triumph, but they must know for what, what should I do with it. But if people like so many segments of present day society and population cannot find any meaning whatsoever in their lives, cannot see anything meaningful, they more often than not have uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, something to live by. Uh, I'd say at least enough to live by. They cannot see anything to live for. What is the answer to the question, why me?
Yeah, so we can see that um, when people are uh, experiencing suffering, they need the added dimension of meaning to help them understand their suffering and to even find meaning, what Frank would say, you know, really despite their suffering or in spite of what they're going through. That's where we see human greatness emerge when people, uh, people like my clients, people I've worked through, worked with, people who I aspire to listen to in life, um, those people that were able to, in spite of their conditions, choose their way to look at things in it, with a different lens. Those are people that find meaning in spite of what they're actually going through in their lives. Which leads me to um, the topic of uh, my new book that's coming up and somebody that I've been watching uh, for many years. Um, I'm sure some of you know him or many of you know of him, Rabbi Yitzi Horowitz. Now, Yitzi Horowitz is uh, a rabbi in California who was stricken with AL ALS, which is Lou, Lou Gehrig's disease. It's a de degenerative neurological disease where a person stops moving and breathing. Um, he, he lies in his bed, uh, his head propped up just to see his family and friends. His lungs are attached to a respirator, but he uses his eyes to write his thoughts and to communicate his heartfelt thoughts on the weekly Torah portion. Every week, my my family and I, we read his, his, his from his own eyes, his understanding of the Torah, Torah portion. Um, he's really somebody that has taught people how to find meaning despite their situation, despite what they're going through in their lives. I just want to play a little bit of um, something about Yitzi and his life on ALS. And here it is. We'll talk about it on the other side of the video. Hey, C-Team. We're on our way to go visit Rabbi Yitzi Hurwitz. We've heard about his story and wanted to hear about it from him directly. We found it so special. We think you'll find it special too. Dear C Teen, I was talented. I could teach, lecture, sing, dance and play guitar. I was strong and handy. Within two years, I watched that all slip away. My muscles that played guitar, gave to my congregation and danced at weddings lost their functionality. They call it ALS. What value is there in a keyboard that can't type, a car that can't drive? or a pencil that can't write. Having lost my ability to contribute, I felt useless. Like I didn't matter. Four years ago, on the day after Rosh Hashanah, my breathing rapidly deteriorated. My wife Dina rushed me to the hospital where I was diagnosed with pneumonia. The doctors presented me with a choice. I could undergo a tracheotomy and live or opt out and bring my suffering to an end. Legally and halakhically, it was my choice. With Dina's support, I chose to live. Over the past few weeks, I couldn't get my eyes to focus on the letters I wanted to write. Writing one word took as long as five minutes. I can't even begin to tell you how frustrating it was. I felt useless as a husband and father. Not being able to write Torah articles, I felt irrelevant. I was in jail. What possible purpose could I have, if I couldn't communicate? Brave and wise, Dina said, on Shabbat, when you don't use the eye gaze computer, you are still significant and relevant. Even if you can only see and look at people, that is meaningful to us. If you are alive, it means that you are relevant to Hashem, and that you make a difference. It is now over five years since Hashem gifted me with ALS. While life is full of difficulties, pain, and suffering, there is so much to be grateful for. While I understand the hardships, I choose to focus on the positive parts of my life, and that keeps me going. There is my wife, my children, family, friends, and you. Even within the suffering and difficulties, I can still contribute and help others. Through my blog, I have the opportunity to learn and teach Torah. I forged new friendships with the teens and yeshiva boys that visit. 
Being crushed has brought stronger connections, new abilities, higher purpose and deeper meaning. I've been blessed with a voice that can't sing. With a body that doesn't work. So I dance to a new rhythm. I'm Yitzi Hurwitz. And I know that I matter. I don't think there's anybody here who could remain unmoved when watching a video about Itzy and his family today and how brave and heroic he is. And really what we need to learn from him is his example in our lives, how we could find meaning, how we could, according to Viktor Frankl, like squeeze out in spite of all these circumstances we are living in and all the circumstances our families are living in and all the circumstances the world is in after COVID and, and violence, all the things we're dealing with today. We need to learn from Yitzhi to find meaning in situations much easier than what he's actually experiencing. We have to help ourselves find meaning, looking for meaning. And ultimately, when we become coaches, help our clients find real meaning in their lives, despite what they're going through. That's what it's all about. And there's a few things we have to learn. And one of the, the greater, greater coaches or the greatest coaches I've seen over the years is Tony Robbins. And what's unknown to people about Tony Robbins until very recently that I discovered this, that he was really, you know, if you've ever seen Tony Robbins, some of you know him, he's this big, big, tall guy, muscular guy, strong, strong guy. He presents such tremendous strength in public with millions of followers. And he's extremely successful. What people don't know is that Tony Robbins was terribly abused as a child. He, had, he claims he had either four stepfathers, or five stepfathers, an alcoholic stepfather, alcoholic mother, extremely abused as a child. And he says in one of his videos, um, what changes life that we'll watch in a minute, but he mentions a few major, major points. And this is what we focus on in coaching as well. We have to make these key decisions in our life. What are those decisions? One, what are you going to focus on? That's your choice. And that's a choice we have to have clients focus on as well. Two, what does this mean? Our decision is how do we interpret meaning? Do we look at it badly? Do you look at it with the possibility of the potential to be good? That's the filter we put on it. Two is once we change our attitude towards it, what am I going to do about it? What am I going to carry out my life? What purpose? That's logotherapy. What am I going to do with that information in the physical world? That's how I find meaning. Not just by thinking about it, but by doing it. And to do that, Tony Robbins claims you have to change your state. To put yourself what he calls a beautiful state. That can all be done in the, even the worst of circumstances. We focus on becoming less of me by focusing more on our creativity, on our passion, our awe, our giving, our caring, and our loving of others. Let's watch Teddy Robbins talk about what he experienced as a child, and I believe what ultimately we all can learn from his experience. Here he is. My life is shaped by a lot of events, but one of the most powerful was somebody doing these kind acts for my family. When I was 11 years old, we had a really, really tough Thanksgiving where there was no money and no food, and we wouldn't have starved. We always found a way to get something, but we weren't going to have a Thanksgiving dinner, that's for sure, certainly not a feast of any sort. And uh, my mom and dad at the time uh, were fighting like cats and dogs, and saying things that once you say them, you can never take them back. You know the kind of stuff I'm talking about? And my mom was screaming at my father about how he couldn't even take care of his own family, and it was horrible. And I have a younger brother and younger sister. I'm the oldest. So I was trying to keep them from hearing this conversation, and then a miracle happened. Bang on the door. I'm the oldest. They're screaming, and so I go answer the door. And I answer the door, and standing there is this giant man. I was this little boy. And he's holding this huge box of food. And beside him on the ground was a black pot with an uncooked turkey in it. And he said, is your father home? And I said, just one moment. <laughs> I was like, unbelievably euphoric. I thought, this is a gift from God. This is going to change it all. This is going to make my mom and dad happy. It's going to be unbelievable. So I go, and my father is screaming at my mother through a closed door to the bedroom door. And I said, Dad, Dad, there's a guy at the door. And he goes, well, you answer the door. I said, I did. He's got to see you. He goes, I, I kind of teased. I said, Dad, you've got to come. 
So he said, fine. He made one last yell at her, and he walks to the door. And I'm waiting there, just can't wait to see his face. And my dad opens the door, and this man's standing there with this big box of food. And my father did not get happy. He looked at this man, and he raised his voice to him, and he said, look, we don't take charity. And then he took the door to slam it in the man's face. But the man was a good-sized man. He put his foot there and smacked his foot and bounced back open. He said, sir, sir, this is not charity. Everybody has tough times. Somebody knows you're having a tough time. And they want you to have a magical Thanksgiving. I'm just the delivery guy. He said, please take this. And my father said, we don't take charity. He went to slam it again. And this time the guy put his shoulder against it so he couldn't do it. And then my father's staring at him. It's like these two males starting to get in this intense mode. And one's just trying to give a gift, and I'm freaking. And then the guy said something that I'll never forget, and in moments I wish he hadn't said, but he found a way to force my father. He's holding this thing, and he looked at me, and then he looked at my dad, and he said, don't make your family suffer because of your ego. Now my dad's level of energy increased, but he was also trapped. You get it? So he took the food, slammed it on our table, and slammed the door in the man's face and never even thanked him. And I, I didn't know what to do. Part of me wanted to cry. Part of me was crushed. And I watched my father storm off and went on back to scream at my mother. And I remember that day just thinking, you know, I don't understand. And years and years later, I began to understand it a little bit. What I began to understand is that you look at a person's life and it's like so much in life you could be joyous about. Like I wanted to smile, you know what I mean? Even now I can remember it. I wanted to smile about this great gift, but now I couldn't even smile because it would make him angry. And then I thought, you know, years I figured out, our whole life is shaped by decisions. That's what we've talked about today, right? But there's three decisions you're making every moment you're alive. And the way you make these three decisions shapes your destiny. First decision we're all making every moment is what are you going to focus on? What are you going to focus on? And you know, I realized that my father's life and my life ended up very different because we made that day three decisions very differently. He decided to focus on the fact that he has not fed his family. And the second question you got to decide, every moment you're alive, including this moment, what are you going to focus on? The second question is, as you're focusing on, what does this mean? What does it mean? And the bottom line on meaning is, if you think about it, you get to make up the meaning, and most people pick the worst one, don't they? That day, my father started to focus on the fact he hadn't fed his family, and I know what meaning he gave because he said it out loud over and over again, that he was worthless because he had not taken care of his family. And then the final and most important decision you make every moment you're alive, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And I'll tell you what he decided to do. He decided to leave our family shortly thereafter. Which at the time was, it was the worst experience of my life. It was the most crushing experience I felt. It's been so many years now, I don't have the same feelings. And Part of it is three years ago he passed away. But at the time, I knew no greater pain. My family knew no greater pain. I couldn't understand why he would leave. I loved him so much. And my life turned out very different than him. I was the only one to go to his funeral. No one else in the family would go. Nobody wanted to be part of it. He died alone of a disease called connective tissue disorder. And I can tell you, right before his death, he got the lesson because he looked at me and he said, son, he said, I was a bastard. I didn't connect with anybody and look what I'm dying of. It's unbelievable. So that same day, I made three different decisions. I decided to focus on the fact there was food. What a concept. I like that. But what changed my life was the meaning I gave it. I decided that day that what this means is that strangers care. And if strangers care about me and my family, I decided what I was going to do is I was going to care about strangers. And that completely changed my life. I promised myself someday I'd do well enough to do this for other families like it was done for me. And I didn't wait till I was you know, wealthy to do it. I did my first one when I was 17. I remember when I was 17, I had my own car, I had some money, and I decided to go on the greatest shopping spree of my life at that point. I said I was gonna go shop for two families for Thanksgiving, and I was gonna go do for families what was done for me so many years before. It was the most euphoric experience. 
I took two baskets. I went to the manager of the place. I told him what I was going to do, and I said, I want you to give me a discount. You be my partner. Give me 10% cheap bastard. <laughs> right? But it was so cool. I got two of everything, right? Because I wanted to get enough food for a family for two or three days and have an unbelievable feast. Then I called this church in the barrio area, and I said, listen, I want to go take care of some families that are too proud to come to the church and get food. So they might suffer. Can you recommend some families? And they gave me two families. So then I wrote a note because I thought, you know what? I'm going to put on old jeans and a t-shirt. And I'm going to deliver this. I'm not going to get the acknowledgement, but I do want to see their faces, right? So all goes the delivery boy, which is easy. I look like one. And, but I wrote this note. And I wrote, I, I don't want him to get upset like my father did. So I wrote this note and I said, this is a gift from a friend. Please know that you're loved. I want you to have an extraordinary Thanksgiving. You deserve it. Please accept this gift. And then I put under it, I said, if you can, someday do well enough to do this for one other family and pass on the gift. And that is the real point. The point is the choice you make, the meaning you give to what you focus on. Tony Robbins, Viktor Frankl, Yitzhi Horowitz, and countless of other, other people could make a choice to go to a state of despair, to go to the state of depression. Instead, they choose to learn something from what happened and share with others. That is the brilliance of life. That's we can go to the deepest parts of human experience and from them learn what is the highest potential we can achieve. That is the example we need to bring towards our clients when we work with our clients, especially as we coach them to do more with their lives and to find more meaning. And that's really why we focus on values with our clients. What are the important values that you want to carry out in your life? It's not about your mother and father, although we need to talk to them about their mother and father. It's not about their traumas. It's not even about COVID. It's what are their, what are their values? What are they going to live for? That's the most important question. We do this by finding out in the intake or after the first few sessions, we have a list I give people. Here's just a few of the values I ask people to choose from. What are your values? Is it authenticity? Is it autonomy? Is it boldness, compassion, contribution, creativity, curiosity, honesty, humor, kindness, leadership, knowledge? How can you best fulfill these values in your daily life? What can I do as your coach to help you fulfill these values? That's right now I'm pointing them in the right direction because that's the direction of Viktor Frankl. That's the direction of Izzy Horowitz. And that's the direction of Tony Robbins. My new book that's coming out shortly is called Viktor Frankl and the Psychology of the Soul, a guide to healing depression, anxiety, and trauma with inspirational therapy, which is my new therapy. I hope to share this with everybody in the next few months. Please God, when it's finished. I've written a book, which is a real guide to Viktor Frankl, bringing down the psychology of the soul, helping people really achieve spirituality in life and showing them how meaning, values, and spirituality can transform any situation they're going through. Um, in the second chapter, when I, uh, first chapter, I read a lot about Viktor Frankl's book, The Unconscious God. In the second chapter called The Royal Road to the Spiritual Unconscious, I uncover a map of all spiritual and meaning-based healing, according to Frankl and others. The lowest level are behaviors in our body, our feelings, our thoughts, our thinking patterns, and our beliefs and identity. This goes up to our childhood and who we are. But if you look to the left of that list, the left of those top, those first six, excuse me, are all just focusing on myself. Not just what I received in life, my genetics, my family and others. But real healing only happens when we go beyond ourselves. So I ask my clients to follow my chart the next four levels, which is find more meaning based upon their values, more spirituality and their ultimate connection with God, which is that everyone has a spark of God within them and to discover it. Those are the seven uh, levels, seven to 10, which I focus in my book and I teach my clients how to actually carry this out in their lives. That's coming up in the next few months, hopefully. It's my honor now to introduce um, a student in my current class who I've been very impressed with. Um, her name is Alana Tobias. She's here with us tonight. I don't want to embarrass her too much. Just to mention a few things about her. She's a parent, a speech therapist, uh, recent graduate of my Taurus psychology programs of the mind, body, and soul trauma in life. 
coaching program. And she shared a lot with us during her classes in public. She talked about her family life. And then she mentioned in one class that she was diagnosed with MS, multiple sclerosis. I wanted to talk to her about that. And what amazing to be about you, Alana, Alana's at the top of the screen tonight, as I was just watching her, she's such a positive coach in the class. She emotes such great energy. And um, I want to welcome you, Alana, and we'll have just a brief discussion um, about your attitude. And I was just wondering if you could share with us a bit about, a little bit about your diagnosis, your life, your diagnosis, and most importantly for tonight, um, how do you do what you do? And you told me those two answers. So let's try to focus on them as well tonight. How do you do what you do, Alana? Just unmute yourself. I have to actually unmute you one second. There we go. No, hold on, hold on. I asked to unmute you. Yeah, now, yeah, there you go. You're on. Yeah, you can hear me? Yeah, okay, great. Okay, so where do you want me to start? The two things that I focus on or? Well, I want to know, just talk a bit about yourself, your life. We have about 10 minutes together now. So within 10 minutes. Okay. Tell us about your life. Uh, I know you're a speech therapist. That means you went through a lot of education, a lot of work experience. You decided to become a coach in the Torah Psychology programs. Um, and I'm just wondering how you keep up with such a great attitude despite what you go through. So I feel good attitude. I grew up in a home where my mother always said, um, take the high road. And my father always said, someone is always going through something worse. My grandparents had a lot of Amun and Bitachon. And while they didn't go through the war, one set of grandparents were in America, the other ones were from Vienna and they escaped and they had a difficult road, but they weren't in the camp. So it was a different road than those who were in the camps and who suffered that way. But they came to America without their parents and they had to start from the bottom at a very young age. So I grew up in a family that just had a lot of love, a lot of Amuna, a lot of Bitafon. Um, and I got married at 21. I went to Stern College for Women. After that, um, I got married while I was in school. And then I went on to get my master's in speech and language pathology. And I it took me a while. I had two kids and my mother helped me through it. And I became a successful speech and language therapist. And when my kids were little, I realized I really wanted to spend time with them. And it wasn't going to work for me to treat little kids. So I treated older kids. And depending on the age of my kids, I worked with kids that weren't their age because I didn't want to feel like drains um, and not have enough energy for my own children. And then um, I was married for 13 years years. And after 13 years, uh, at about the 10 year mark, things started to go, um, unfortunately, in not such a good direction. And I really gave up everything in my life, my family, my everything to try to work my marriage. And after I got divorced, um, I remember the movers came to my house and I couldn't really see so well. And that ultimately led to a diagnosis of MS. I had this double vision and, you know, I had to move into my parents' house with my kids. That was the result of the divorce. And it just, it, it everything ended up working out for the best because I had my parents' support. And thank God I got remarried about a year and a half later, which I didn't anticipate to do. I thought I'm getting married once, that's it. But I just had a positive attitude. I said, you know what? There got to be nice guys out there. I started to go out on some dates, realized there were nice men out there. I ended up marrying my husband, the most amazing person in this world. And I had, I really felt like, oh, wow, I had a second chance in life. And I ended up relocating to New Jersey from Long Island. And I got certified as a speech and language therapist. I worked here. And then during COVID, um, the place that I worked, which is a medical daycare, closed down so I could no longer work as a speech and language therapist. And while I really was great at what I did, I just like towards the end was just not loving it so much. And when COVID hit, I was kind of relieved that I didn't have to go back to work. I was like, this is not what I want to be doing. I don't miss it at all. And I, I was really looking for something to do. And, you know, when I, I saw different advertisements, I realized like, this is something I want to do. But I said, oh, do I want to go back to school? Do I want to go back to school? No. And then my, my husband was very encouraging. And I ended up taking this course. And um, I'm so grateful that I did. And because I wanted something meaningful to do. Um, getting back to how I have a positive attitude, I really surround myself with positive people. I don't have room in my life for any negativity. 
I read things that make me feel good. I focus a lot on my amuna, on my bitachon. I really, as Rabbi Ephraim Goldberg said, I mentioned this so many times, I really nourish my amuna muscle, Rabbi David Asher. I just, I really listen to tons of shirim and surround myself with people that are feel good people. And because of that, I would just lead a very meaningful life because I'm surrounded with like minded people and I'm just able to to tap into that and to really allow those values to to help me live a very meaningful happy life I mean we choose to be happy and I really have chosen that path because I want to be there for my children and for my husband been and for for my friends and you know I didn't even mention the MS so much but I really don't focus on that and let that define who I am yes I have multiple sclerosis thank God I do what I need to do to stay healthy I I practice um I take Pilates I follow a healthy diet I, I do what I need to do to stay healthy and I really just tap into my amuna and know that Everything that I've experienced in my life is for a reason that Hashem wanted me to go through everything to get me to the point where I'm at. So when things are not going so well, like I really don't focus on that negativity. I say, okay, I'm here for a reason. I'm not going to let it hold me back. I'm going to move forward. I re most recently went to the doctor. I had to go for an MRI and he saw five new lesions on my brain. It wasn't really what I wanted to hear. I said, okay, things are going to be okay. Could be worse. It's not cancer. It's not something else. I'm not going to let that bring me down. I'm just going to keep moving forward. What could I do? He wanted to change my medicine. I said, okay, we're going to change the medicine. We're going to do what we need to do and just want to move forward and not get stuck on, on the negativity because it's not going to do me any good. And I want to feel that sense of calmness. And that's what I just do. I just focus on the positive. Incredible. And what, what type of message do you want to share with your clients that you're working with in the future? I think that people need to find that inner peace. They need to find that sense of calm and know that everything comes from Hashem. Everything comes from Hashem. And the more a person realizes that the more they tap into that it was interesting because i was listening to a share this morning and this rabbi ephraim goldberg from rabbi um from boca raton synagogue said it amuna is like an app we just have to download that app i've downloaded that app a long time ago i know not everybody has a smartphone but you really have to tap into that and get to that to that core of that amuna and realize that everything is that hashem does is for a reason and if you could understand that it makes life a little bit easier and things don't always turn out the way they want it's not always a a happy ending just because you have a amuna it would be nice if things always turned out the way that we want but they don't but i think that if if a person could understand that it will allow them to move forward in life and to deal with life's challenges because we all have challenges we, nobody goes through on through life un, untouched it just they don't everybody goes through something so we could either decide to let us to let those things bring us down or to say, okay, they're just going to make us stronger. We're going to move forward and we're going to deal with it. You think I wanted to get remarried at 35 after being married for 13 years and relocate? But I, I just said, you know what? I'm going to move forward at the right time. I wasn't ready right away. And, you know, thank God I have my Amuna to hold on to because that really gets me through. It really, really does. Well, I just want to thank you for your enthusiasm your tremendous insight, your your courage, your bravery. And I can tell you a really in, a tremendous inspiration for all of us. And we hope to share your message with uh, countless other people uh, who we work with in life. So thank you so much for joining us. Such a pleasure to have you in our courses so far. And thank keep up, you. All, up your great work. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're so welcome. You're so welcome. And that's really the point, isn't it? It's about what Viktor Frankl said. Alana is really just the perfect example of what Viktor Frankl said. It's ultimately about the choices we make in spite of our circumstances and it's the values we choose to live by which ultimately lift us up like tremendous wind and carry us high above to be able to experience things that we didn't think would be imaginable during our circumstances that we experience and with that in mind we are up now to our award ceremony 
the Victor Frankl Award Ceremony 2023. Uh, from here on, each year we're going to be honoring three of our graduate students who have shown excellence in their work. Um, it has been a privilege over the last six or seven years to uh, educate all, almost a thousand, a thousand different people. So almost a thousand people in our programs, maybe over a thousand people at this point, and many of them uh, have gone on to help other people. Some of you have decided to just uh, help yourselves, help your children at risk, your teens at risk, help your spouses, help people in your family. Others have gone out and have built coaching practices from our programs and are earning money and helping other people in a very professional way. So it's my honor to uh, introduce three of our award, our graduates from our programs with the Victor Frankl Award. And here we're going to interview each, each of them just for a few minutes each, hear about their story um, and find out what they're doing with their coaching programs. And the first award goes to somebody who's innovated in the world of parenting coaching. He's done a lot of this work. He, his name is Rabbi Yossi Haritan. He based in Montreal. He's a graduate of our transformational life coaching program several years ago. And he's the founder of a wonderful website. I suggest everybody goes on and watches his work and, and gets into his teachings. It's called temperthetantrum.com. And I'd like to welcome uh, Rabbi Haritan, one of our graduates tonight. I just have to find your other oh, Rabbi Haritan. I'm going to spotlight you and put you up for everyone to see and ask you just a few questions. Um, I just wondering, number one, um, what made you take my course in the first place several years ago? Oh, I have to unmute you. One second. Let me let me uh, unmute you carefully here. It's a little trickier. Yeah, now I go. I have to ask, and now you can try. There we go. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, you can hear me well? Yeah, you're great. Go ahead. Excellent. So um, that's a good question. What what made me take your, your course to begin with? I guess at the time I was um, transitioning from a, a uh, for many years in the uh, Leading, um, leading um, Chinuch institutions as a principal, and um, something was pulling me towards the uh, the area of parenting, and I was developing uh, a course at the time, a parenting course, and developing some tools, some parenting tools, um, emotional um, emotions cards, and uh, some sort of a, a game as well for children to be able to work through conflict, like a conflict resolution game. Um, and this is just all based on my experience over the years. And um, in, as I'm working through this, I figured it would be it would be interesting to know as if I'm going to work with parents in this type of a way to help them move forward in their relationships with their children. What um, you know to get, gain some tools to gain some uh, background in in working uh, more professionally, I guess in this. Um, in this area. So that's that's kind of what led me. I did a little research and bumped into you and um, it was a very, uh, very rewarding uh, process to uh, to take the course at the time. It must have been like, I think it was 2018. It's going back a number of years. That's wonderful. I want to share with everybody um, your website so we can take a look at what you do, the great work that you do. Uh, everybody could join me or watch this here. Uh, Rabbi Haritan launched a fantastic website. I've actually watched it several times over the years. You don't know that, but it's called Temper the Tantrum. And look at his message, something I teach in all our programs. When you take one of my programs, we teach you um, how to market yourself and how to build your product from your website and how to really define what's your message for your client. How can you help people? And that's what Rabbi Haritan says. Let me help you manage your kids. Temper the Tantrum with Rabbi Yossi Haritan is a successful research-based program for managing your child's behavior and emotional outbursts. Well said, and, and you know, good luck in uh, all your programs. You have, a, it looks like you have a new online course people can purchase. It's um, accessible online right now, downloadable. That's really wonderful. Um, I wanted to just play for the group uh, a little short video. You can see the level of his production. This is what he's created.
to give a little history behind this, uh, behind this website. So uh, what happened was I was giving this uh, parenting course. Actually, I was using Zoom before Zoom became popular. And um, at, at the end, uh, I, I realized that it would be very helpful. It's interesting because the coaching process really uh, is guided a lot by the goals of the of the people that we're working with. But I still felt like there were there were some core uh, competencies which parents needed to have in order to um, in order to work with their children and things that I wanted them to have as foundations to um, to understand and to make my conversations with them uh, more simple. And so what I did was it was this is as as we slipped into COVID, I, I took this course and I recorded it and um, I created something that parents can access um, on their own and on their own time and really broken up in a way that comes with exercises and whatnot. And as a as a basis for the conversations that I that I have with them. So I found that, you know, that's kind of the history behind the behind the development of the of the website, the course that's on the that's currently on the website. Um, I also want to share just a one quick um, one quick story, which I, I find to be really at the core of a lot of the work that I do that I that I share with people. And this is um, I don't, this is a story of the Lamavitcher Rebbe, which I found to be extremely powerful um, from a, a holoc that I heard from a Holocaust survivor and his son-in-law. And um, this Holocaust survivor had gone in. Um, this is going back to the 70s. It wasn't a, a Chabad Chassid, but um, he was. Uh, you know, remain, you know, went through the difficult process after the war of retaining his Yiddishkeit, but very, very strong in terms of his amuna, and really rebuilt his family, um, came, you know, moved, moved here to America, and uh, his oldest um, son was not quite uh, following in the way that his father would have expected it. And this father was a, was a Ben Taira, somebody who really took time from his business over the years to really focus on, on learning Torah and to encourage other people to learn Torah. That was you know, a major, major focus of his life. And here was this son who was probably at that time in his 20s already, or approaching his 20s, and uh, the father didn't feel like he was seeing nachas from his, from his child. And uh, what ended up happening was he was, his daughter was marrying a, a Chabad Chassid and he went to Yechidus by the Rabbi. And uh, he wrote in his satel, he wrote in his pan, he wrote, all about this this child, and he was in, so overcome with the emotion he couldn't express anything, and he was just crying. And the Rebbe took a look at this at this uh, at his paper and looked up at him with this big smile and said in Yiddish, "Erzdach aguta yingle." He is a good child, and uh, I think this kind of touches a little bit on what you were saying, um, 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 what we were hearing earlier from uh, from Viktor Frankl about you know looking. We ha we have to look at the the best in potential that exists in everyone. And the Rebbe was essentially telling this father, you have to have the right perspective. Look at your child, no matter what they do, you have to look at them as the best. And uh, he's a good kid, he's a good kid. Have that perspective. And when you have that perspective, everything else will, will be able to clarify itself. And, it, and ultimately that's what happened. You know, the, the, the man, you know, the, the, that 20 year old today is, a, is uh, already marrying off his grandchildren and, um, and obviously doing doing very well, but I, I find that you know that to just to be a very um, important mindset that uh, that really helps parents to see things from you know, away from all the anxiety that creeps in when things are not going well. Anyway, thank you very much, and uh, you're welcome. You this program and uh, much hatslacha b'ezus Hashem with uh, your past and future students. I mean, thank you so much, Rabbi Haratan. I'd like to um, thank you again and give you the first. I know we can't do this in person because of COVID or post-COVID, but as you live in Montreal too, the, the Taurus Psychology Victor Frankl Award 2023 of Achievement proudly presented to Rabbi Haritan for serving his community and clients the high standards and values in the field of parenting coaching. So congratulations to you. We'll be sending to you that diploma shortly. Keep up your great work. We look forward to hearing more things from you. And hopefully I can mention on behalf of other students, I'm sure people are quite inspired about your work and see what is possible to do with their own coaching work. So thank you so much. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, great. Uh, our, our second award is in the field of educational coaching. People that work with children, um, we're lucky to have with us a wonderful teacher uh, from our community here. And she is a former Chabad Shlucha in Maui, in Hawaii, which has not been going through a lot of good things lately. Uh, she's the author of a Jewish homeschool blog 
with over 3 million views and a book called Maui Kosher, which I'll suggest you watch and purchase. She's a certified Montessori primary teacher, graduate at the Transformational Life Coaching Program, and she created a website after a coaching program called the, it's called unconventionalcoach.com. And uh, I'll just tell you a bit about her. Um, she talks a bit about her life and her work in her website. And she does some tremendous work helping people uh, discover curriculum if they're homeschooling, for example, um, and other things in their lives specifically pertaining to helping with uh, parenting, excuse me, and education. So she focuses a lot on education and parenting as well. Um, here is a very short clip of her speaking. She was unprepared for this, I'm sure, but a very short clip of her speaking um, on a interesting blog that I discovered online about her. I'm just going to play just a, just a minute of her video with you tonight. One second. And here it is. trauma and so many kids are insecure and they lack confidence and so many kids are in different forms of medication and some of the medications work and it's amazing and some of the medications don't and that's the reality of the situation but we're all just trying to find a solution for the pain of life and that's kind of it's the human it's a human experience almost regardless of what a child has gone through or what they're going through action-oriented love is truly one of the most powerful healing agents out there as we were talking about and it's so important to emphasize that so so I really want to get to the practically speaking terms in an everyday regular scenario. What does action oriented love look like? Can you please give us some examples? Sure, sure. So I'm speaking now not from the idea of action oriented love. I'm speaking from experience. Yes. In both being a mother, being a wife, being a teacher. And I'll give little examples from each area just to illustrate it and make it clear. Perfect. So let's start with being a teacher because that's a nice, easy topic. Um, I love teaching. And very often someone will walk into my classroom and the kids are, I would say 99.9% .9 of the time, always doing what they gotta be doing. You'll have kids sitting on the floor, kids sitting on a beanbag, I teach fourth grade, kids laying on the floor, kids sitting in their desks, but everyone is always doing what they need to do. And I'm often asked like, oh my gosh, you know, like you let kids talk in class, you let kids sit on the floor, you let kids just leave whenever they want. Like you just have this free for all, but everyone's doing so well. What's, what's going on over there? All the kids are really happy. You would think, that when you give children freedom and trust, they're little barbarians who are just gonna like go crazy. But I feel like, you know, society has it so wrong. It's like people think kids are like, you know, I, don't, I can't think of a better word, like stupid. Like they think kids don't know things. And unless we teach them, they're not gonna know how to act like a normal human being. And when we show children trust in the beginning of the school year, I sit down on my desk and I say to my students, my new students who I've never met, I'm like, okay, what can we do to have a healthy functioning classroom? What can we do? Good question, yep. You know, not these are my rules or what rules should we put into place so you little people can follow them and we can have this, you know, quiet classroom, what can we do to create an environment that's so pleasant for you guys to learn in, pleasant for me to be in, let's talk about it. And we get into the most incredible conversations and these kids come up with such great ideas. And I'll tell you, I have a policy. If you need the bathroom, you don't need to ask me. You go to the bathroom because it's a human need <laughs> to go to the bathroom. Right. And if you gotta go, you gotta go. Right. And and if you need to take a few minutes and step outside the classroom, because granted, I have like between 25 and 27 students, right. you, you can come over and say, Mrs. Schusterman, I just need a few minutes. No problem. You're in this classroom for eight hours. Everyone needs a little bit of time of quiet. And I will tell you, 
kids barely, barely asked me to leave the classroom. I'd like to call upon Tanit to join us. I have to ask to unmute you, so please uh, accept the invitation and let me highlight you. And Tanit, I'd just like to commend you on your work in that interview. Uh, a few questions. What got you to take our transformational life coaching program in the first place? And what did you learn and what do you hope to do with it? Um, so I've been involved in education for as long as I can remember. It's just, it's my heart. It's my soul. It's, it's just, it comes very naturally to me. Same thing, you know, in my parenting, I have very similar philosophies and you know, I would speak to a lot of the parents of my students that I was currently teaching or relatives whose, you know, other kids were struggling in different areas. And I would just, I guess I would ask the right questions and, you know, offer different pieces of advice. And very often, you know, people would say, oh my gosh, you know, you should do this. For, you know, you should, you should be a therapist. You know, I guess they didn't really, you know, you should do this for a living. You should help people, you know, you should guide them. And I'm like, no, 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 that's definitely not my thing. And, but it was my thing because I was doing it, not even realizing that I was doing it. And then I saw your course and, you know, I thought to myself, I, I really respect Victor, Victor Frankel and, you know, I've read his book and it's fascinating and I would love to learn more about it just for myself, just as a person, just as a mother, I think it would be really helpful just in my life. and you know, in general, I'm not the best student, but I, you know, taking your course, it was, it was so fascinating. It was so interesting. It was very engaging and I really, really enjoyed it. And I just remember on our last day of class, you said to us, I don't remember your exact words, but you said, now take this and make it yours. And I just remember thinking like, wow, like, I think I'm going to do this. And I just thought, you know what, let's do it. And I made my website and it started off as educational life coach, because that's how it started off. But I found the more I spoke to people whose children were not in school or whose children were struggling in school, there was a lot more to the story. And, co and COVID was happening also during this time. Yes. Correct. 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 Exactly. So there was just a lot more to it than just the educational lens. So, you know, again, I'm not your conventional person in the way that I do things, just like you see with my teaching. And, you know, the different things I would tell people, advise them to do we're not necessarily your, you know, run of the mill, you know, advice. Like, you know, a lot of people will say, you know, if your child's not going to school, bribe them, take that, you know, get them an ice cream or, you know, I wouldn't say that. I'm like, if your kid's not going to, doesn't want to go to school, there's a reason. And all the ice cream in the world is not going to make things better. You know, if your kid's refusing to do, you know, no child wakes up one morning and decides to be miserable. It just, <laughs> that's not the way it works. There's always something deeper. And working together, like, you know, sometimes I say, you know, once finding out more information, sometimes I say, you know what, this, this is beyond my capabilities. And I refer them to a therapist or refer them to a psychiatrist. Like you gave us such clear tools in how to conduct ourselves as coaches to know like exactly where we start and where we end. And when it's time to tell them, you know what, this is not in my area, you know, I'm going to recommend you somewhere else. And it's just been like, I honestly, I have my website. I don't have any social media and it's really been word of mouth because I think in this day and age, there are so many people who have at least one child that is struggling in the education system. And sometimes it's such an easy fix. Sometimes it really, really is. And sometimes it's a lot more complicated. And, you know, I, I've met so many different types of people and I network, you know, let's I find out there's a woman in Crown Heights with a 12 year old that she's homeschooling and there's another woman with a 12 year old, I'll connect them. And then they're having a nice year together. So it's just been, it's opened like so many really nice doors. People are helping each other 
through this and it's just been such such a great and positive part of my life that I never planned but it just really you know I I feel like it just like literally when you said take it and make it yours I just hit the ground running and I and, you know and, and all you needed was to sit with us for 15 weeks of classes do the homework practice with students I think you enjoyed the practice work we used to do in the class everybody we broke them off into pairs and all it needed was the confidence and some of the structure I gave you to take all that tremendous experience you had as an educator turn into something even bigger than before. And I think that's really what happened to you, didn't it? After exactly. the program. Exactly. Exactly. Exactly what you said. Like I'm sure every single person on this conference has something, has something that they already know that they're already good at, that it's there, you know, and like you really helped take it and like highlight it and just give us that confidence to use it so a-okay fantastic and thank you so much for your personal example your work as a shlucha your work as an educator and a writer and your inspiration to all of us and good luck in all your endeavors in the future and i'd like to uh um give you the uh, torah psychology victor frankel award of 2023 of achievement um in the field of education thank you so much for your work and We'll be sending that to you shortly, and we hope to hear even greater things from you in the future. Thanks for joining us. Okay, great. All right. And finally, for our third awardee tonight, is my honor to unmute you, Sariafi, and to uh, highlight you. Um, our next honoree is somebody who I met more recently in our classes. Um, she took my addiction coaching program last year. And um, uh, honestly, I didn't know that what you, the direction you'd go in at the time, but she actually turned out to be a fantastic coach in the field of addiction. Um, she has, and correct me if I'm wrong, a history, a background in real estate, in different levels, different aspects of real estate. She comes from the business community, not necessarily an educator, Rabbi Rebitson. Um, she works in title titling. Um, she's a HUD housing counselor as well as listed on your LinkedIn. And she recently became an addiction recovery coach and had the privilege of having her get in my course because we're just halfway through our addiction recovery program this year. And it's an honor to have you. And so I just wanted to welcome you and I want to spotlight you and just um, ask you the same few questions. Uh, what, what got you to take the course in the first place? Um, what did you learn and what are you learning and how are you carrying it out in the real world? Hi, so first I wanna say how honored I am to be here and how humbled I am by the previous two honorees. I'm nowhere near their level of expertise or experience or anything that they have done. Um, I have yet to write a book. Hopefully one day I will, but from what I've taken in your courses has taught me so much more than that. Um, all my life, people have been telling me that I should go into this line of work therapy, psychology, coaching, helping people. I can't take much credit for it. God gave me a gift of listening. And that's really what people started to tell me about this. When I first did some research on it, um, I saw your ad in one of the magazines showing a course, I think at the time was addiction recovery, actually. And I look, looked at it, I saw it, it struck me, it was you know, interesting. And then I kind of just put it away. Life got a little bit hectic and I, you know, took me a little bit more time. I couldn't find it after that for some, a few weeks. And then all of a sudden it appeared again in one of the magazines and I'm looking through it and I see it's going to happen on the one night that I happen to have a free night that night and it's on Zoom. I don't need to go anywhere. And you were giving a special at the time. It was just so many different um, good things about it that I kind of felt it was God's plan that I should take it. And I figured, you know what, let me give it a try. And since then I've taken about four of your courses and I saw tonight that you're giving it in a child course. I'm going to sign up for that as well. Um, it's interesting as you, as I see clients, I get to see what type of wor more work I want to learn so that I can help clients as well. Um, I started off really with the life coaching and um, it went okay. It wasn't so much, I didn't feel that that 
yearning that like fulfillment with it. And then I started, and then I, you know, continued on. I had a few clients with addiction recovery and it was an absolute mind boggling, just unbelievable experience. How these people are trying so hard to get healthy, to get better, to heal. And therapy is fantastic for them, really. I actually, most of my clients, I, you know, steer towards therapy if they need a psychiatrist as well. What I do with them is more of the day-to-day -day coping, the day-to-day -day activities that they need. They go to rehab, they detox, they come back, and now what? And we go through different, the jobs, the nutrition, the exercise, different meeting, the 12-step program to join a program to get a sponsor and to continue sober living. Um, what I, when I did, went through my own journey and I did my own healing before I started all this, I thought I learned a lot. I thought I had a whole toolbox of tools and skills to be able to just live day to day a healthier life, anxiety, depression, whatever it was, you get through. When I took your course, I saw I knew absolutely nothing. I went from having a toolbox to having a tool shed. It was an amazing experience to see how something like the somatic work of just noticing your body, notice the sensations, don't do anything about it. For the my clients for addiction recovery, they have to do so much already to stay sober that if I can give them this method of just, just feel the sensation in your body, notice the sensation in your body, stick with it for some time, and it goes away, let it go and keep going. And it's it was just a, a very, very fascinating um, experience for me to learn all these things. I believe that, you know, Victor Franco said, the meaning of life, the meaning of suffering. I believe God made me go through whatever it was that I went through in life in order for me to help others. And God gives me the tools that I need, the skills that I need, and the support that I need to do that. And I am super grateful that God showed me the way here, gave me your courses, and gave me the biggest tool of them all. So thank you, Rabbi Shalbach. This was an amazing experience for me, really. And just learning all those things for myself, for my kids, for my clients, it has enhanced so much. I actually had a client text me tonight about something that we did. If she can share it with somebody else, yeah, it's just, it's just nice. I'm humbled. I, I'm just really God's messenger to try and help these these people um, to have a healthier life. And where do you see yourself in five years? If you could just cut a dream for a moment as this coach. I would, would like say? to start actually, I would like to start an addiction recovery clinic type of thing where people who are in recovery already, they go to programs, they do all that, um, they have sponsors and it's just a place where to, to just, pick up different skills for different different um, triggers that come up in their lives. Maybe have some sort of group group coaching where everyone can ex exchange different ideas. People go through different things and they use different ideas and different skills and different tools. And sometimes, sometimes it's just a simple tool that you really don't even realize um, helps. And just to have that exchange where people can sit around and exchange, you know, this, this is what helped me. This is what helped, you know, the other person I know from my own experiences, it has helped so much to know, not necessarily did somebody have to go through what I went through, but the experience was the same and the tool that they used really helped. And I gave it a try and it helped me. So I do, would, I would love to be able to do something like that. I find that there is a tremendous lack of assistance in this type of way in our community when it comes to addiction recovery. I know it's it's more of a, a hidden issue. It's, you know, it, it is coming out to be more of awareness, but, you know, I had, I had spoke to parents the other night of one of my clients and they wanted to know how come there's not like, how come the world doesn't know about this? And it's it's unfortunate, but I'm, I'm truly hoping through your classes actually, and through you know the advertisements and all that, I really hope that this gets out because people do need when they come back and they acclimating into the world, 
they need these coaching skills. They need the therapy as well, but the therapy is not the same as the coaching skills that I have got from your, your courses. Well, that's so wonderful. And I want to thank you for your great work, your insight, your inspiration to me as well, to hear that you're doing such great work for my teachings and Victor Frankl's teachings and others. Thank and um, I just want to mention some of the things that Sarah mentions on her, on her PR is that the client can reach out to her whenever they need. Um, she gives them daily living skills to live a healthier, uh, more productive life. She works on sober plans. She does CBT, somatic experiencing, self-empowerment, self-esteem, job options, nutrition, and exercise. So she really offers quite a bit to her clients. And I'd like to honor you tonight with the Torah Psychology Victor Frankl Award of 2023 of achievement as an addiction recovery coach. And wish you, Sarah, tremendous success in all your endeavors. So congratulations you so to you. Welcome. Thank Pleasure. You. Let me just minimize everything. And with that, we come to the end of the conference. Isn't that amazing? I'm always punctual right at nine o'clock. I did it again. I don't know how. Um, I'd like to just remind everybody of uh, five upcoming training programs. We actually have six, but these are five listening right now. Uh, the Transformational Life Coaching Program is starting again November 7th after the Antovim. The Mind, Body, and Soul and Trauma for Trauma is starting December 6th. People that really want to work with trauma, that's a great program for them. Marriage and Intimacy. January 8th. These again, these are weekly pro these are programs that go on for 15 weeks, different nights of the week. And then starting in February 4th, 2024, a brand new program called Killing the Inner Child. And then we're doing again back to our system of addiction recovery starting after the Antovim. So I'd like to welcome everybody uh, to join join our programs. Everything can be found at TorahPsychology.org. Please tell your friends. Have a Shanatabha Mituka. Good Geben Shior. Wishing you more success and finding more meaning in your lives. And we'll be in touch again in our programs in the future. Good night, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thanks for joining us. Take care.